do this, we have done this in the past in the theater or in uh, Camlet, and we've been able to see people's faces. So we trust that you're there and listening, uh, and we're grateful to be able to present that. So today we are going to talk about our next production that is part of our uh our spring season, the first time we've done a season in April, which is how we've adjusted to the COVID situation to try to do seasons that we could produce and keep everybody safe and keep our artists safe. And so this is a new experience for us to have performances in April, but we're glad that the people are, look like they're attending. We have good ticket sales for them and uh, we're presenting operas that we haven't done. And this one in particular, Il Signor Buschino, and we're going to talk with some members of the production team and cast today and introduce, I will introduce them to you one by one. The first are our ubiquitous artistic director and principal conductor, Maestro Victor Dorenzi. Maestro, if you'll unveil yourself. Let's see, Maestro Dorenzi is there. And uh, he is... Um, at home, I think, correct? I am at home, being okay, ubiquitous, good. ubiquitous as you. Then our stage director for tonight, for our production is Stephanie Sundin. And we, Stephanie, if you will unveil yourself and. Uh, <laughs> okay. And um, our, uh, base for Il Signor Brusino, Stefano De Peppo. Stefano is there. And I'm going to switch to you so you can see everybody. And then joining us uh, for, I think this is his first Meet the Artist, because Stefano has done it a number of times. I know Stephanie has done it. But um, our baritone Alex Boyd is joining us. Alex, if you will unveil yourself. Oh, that's nice. I'm glad somebody else decided to wear a jacket. That's good. <laughs> so welcome. And we are glad you're all here. And we're going to talk about our production today. And first of all, uh, I'd, you know, Maestro, everybody knows you, but do you want to say a little word of welcome to everybody? Yeah, I do. I'm glad we are here producing opera. We have returned part of our community, our Sarasota Opera community of singers and, and instrumentalists, technicians. And it, it's really good to have people back and to hear noise around the opera house. We've had a pretty quiet opera house for a year. And I think it was Verdi who once said that theaters were not built to, to remain empty. So uh, I'm, I'm, it's just nice to have so many people back and to hear, to, I'm sure if any of you have walked by the Opera House, you've heard singing and that's us, that's who we are. Great. Well, Stephanie, I know most of the people who are uh, with us today know who you are, but maybe if you could give us a little introduction and uh, say maybe what you've been doing for the last year. Right, I've been uh, preparing for this moment uh, that and surtitles for our production. <clears throat> um, it has been an interesting year for all of us, of course, but I was so delighted for the singers and for everyone to be able to get back to the theater and uh, to produce these wonderful operas. I really enjoy the operas in the winter. I, I was involved with surtitles, but not directing either one of them, but I enjoyed both of them so much. And it's, it's been great fun to prepare Bruschino, especially with the splendid cast that we have. So um, I, people know me, I don't think I need to do the biography, <laughs> but I'm very glad that everyone has, so many people have joined us for today. That's, that's wonderful. And I do want to say a, a little bit of your biography. It just, we, everybody should wish Stephanie a happy birthday because today is Stephanie's birthday. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. um, Stefano, you were on our Meet the Artists for La Serva Padrona that we did in February, but introduce yourself again and just say a few words, I think, for our audience sitting at home. Sure. I, uh... Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here again. I'm Stefano De Peppo. Um, I'm Italian, born and raised, but I live in uh, New York City. And uh, I, uh, this is my seventh uh, time here in 
at Sarasota Opera, and it's fantastic to be back from 2008 until now. Uh, as everybody knows, we have been completely uh, in standby for uh, one year. Actually, one year ago, uh, I was here during the uh, beginning of this uh, very difficult moment, the pandemic, and uh, um, shows were canceled because of that. So it's nice to be back after one year, to be back here and to restart from, uh, from uh, again. Uh, and it's, it's, it's an amazing pleasure to be able to, to be on stage again. Great. Now, Alex, I think this is your first time you've ever done a Meet the Artist for us. So why don't you introduce yourself? I know people, you've been on our stage for a number of years now, and I'm sure people are familiar with you, but maybe a little introduction would be appropriate. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. My name is Alex Boyd. I My first season here was in the fall of 2012 as a apprentice artist. And uh, interestingly, before that, I met Richard and Maestro because I was at uh, Opera New Jersey with them the summer before. Uh, but I came back as a young artist a few times, uh, 2015, 16, 17, 18, part of 19, and then now, and so it's wonderful to be here and, and involved as a, having climbed the ladder as it were. <laughs> and where are you from, Alex, originally? I'm from Percival, Virginia, originally, but mm -hmm. I live here in Tampa. Oh, you're in Tampa now, you're not in Sarasota. That's right. Yes. You're home, okay, good. Well, it's great to have you here. Um, Alex is also married to soprano Hannah Bramer. Uh, a wedding that took place last, about a year ago, right? It's, Almost. Yeah. In this very room, actually. Well, part of it. Part of it took place on our stage. Right. Yes. <laughs> and officiated by Maestro Dorenzi. Exactly. So um, just to tell everybody a little bit about how this works, in case you haven't joined us via Zoom, we'll have a conversation amongst the five of us about... Uh, this production about doing opera during this time, a little bit about the thoughts about Il Signor Bruschino. And then we will open it up to questions. And you can, uh, those members of our audience, we can't see you or hear you at the moment. You can either uh, add a question to the Q&A box, which depending on what kind of computer you're uh, using, it might be on the bottom of your screen or it might be on the top of your screen. But if you see a a box that has uh, little word bubbles and Q&A. That's where you can enter some questions and we will have that answered at the end of our uh, session here. Or if you are particularly brave and wanna speak up, I can. Uh, you can raise your hand and there should be a raise hand icon somewhere on your screen. You could do that. And when we get to the end, I will unmute you and allow you to speak if you would like. So either way, if you want to uh, pose a question to our distinguished assembly here, uh, but we'll start off by just having a conversation with each of them, or and hopefully I'd like you know some interaction if you wanna talk on top of each other, I think that's fine. Uh, and just share some views about this opera. So Maestro, when let's talk about this opera in particular and how, how we came about this, how we found it, how you found it, and and how we came to decide to do it. Well, you know, I, I think uh, we we worked very hard to try to find a season that we could do. We've how many permutations did we do, Richard? About five of them, I guess. I think, yeah. And, and as uh, as as we were doing that, we realized that there's there was too much floating in the air to take chances on something too big or too small, but we wanted to do something that represent that we could do and represent well. And that uh, you could kind of go to the opera as you can come to the opera in a couple of weeks and it, do the same production of this opera that you would have seen at Sarasota Opera if we had done it at, at 20 and 18. So we eliminated immediately doing Aida. That was off forget about that. We did not do our ring cycle, although we considered it. So there are a number of chamber operas that, and many of which we have not done. And in looking through those, we uh, come across, uh, I, I don't even know Richard at this point, because we were both looking all over the place and uh, came across a series of Rossini operas. He wrote five of them within a very short time called Farces, that were Farsa, Una Farsa in Italian. And uh, they were written for a, a theater a little smaller than our theater. 
and with a with an orchestra the size that we could put in our orchestra pit it had they had no chorus and uh they just seemed to be written for this situation so it's as if rossini knew covid would happen he did. And he would create some pieces that might work. Okay. That's well, good. I guess maybe going through cholera and, and many other uh, things that happened before COVID, the, this situation did exist in, in kind of many guises throughout history, throughout the world's history. Yeah. So he was we should very remind happy. ourselves that this is not the first pandemic. And, and, no. just, <laughs> no. Um, you used a term uh, in in describing it a, a chamber opera, which I think might confuse people. So, could you explain what a chamber opera is, as opposed to another kind of opera? Chamber operas tend to be smaller. They tend to uh, their the orchestras are smaller. We're used to at Sarasota Opera doing, I think, we we've had as many as seventy five uh, instrumentalists in our orchestra pit, and. Uh, usually a big chorus because we seem to love Verdi a lot here and Verdi love the chorus and choruses love Verdi. So chamber operas tend not to have that, uh, those big forces involved with them. And th there are many of them. Some of them are really good. Like I think Signor Buschino is, and there are not that, there are many that are, are not as good, but uh, there, there's a very big repertoire out there mm -hmm. of chamber, of smaller works. Yeah. I think it was interesting when we started looking at how many, you know, permutations they were, there were of, of chamber operas in, in various guises over the years. So was, I'm glad we were able to find it. Um, so for the other three of you, had you, had you heard of Il Signor Buschino? Did you know the work? Did any of you, Stefano, did you, had you run into I, this? I, I did. I did. I mean, I, I knew the name uh, from or of course, because being one of the farces, uh, I, I knew it just by name. And I actually uh, already uh, had the opportunity to sing it uh, four years ago in uh, Mexico uh, in a production. It was put uh, quite uh, quickly, but it was a, for me a, a very nice opportunity to, to dive in and to uh, enjoy this little piece, which has really uh, so many uh, elements already of, of Rossini, of the more mature Rossini, but actually, uh, and Maestro can confirm that uh, in really in the year uh, when uh, Il Signor Bruschino was premiered, also Rossini started to uh, put in the oven and to take out from the oven uh, already bigger um, works that became worldwide uh, known. So um, yes, and um, to uh, summarize, I knew the opera and I, uh, um, so for me, it was a very nice opportunity here to uh, refresh it and to, um, to be put together with a different cast, of course, a very, very talented cast and, uh, and recreate because I think it's every time that we, uh, even if we already have sung one opera, every time that we re uh, present it uh, with a different cast and situation and a conductor, uh, director. It's like a little bit to 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 beginning from start. Okay, that's that's great. That's great. I I guess I knew that you had done it before, but did you do the same role that you? you yes, you, you're yes. doing this one. What, what and what is the character you're playing? The play, the character I play is is called Gaudenzio, uh, who is a sort of a, a, a interesting character because usually I tend to play more uh, comic roles. And of course, this is a comedy and uh, all roles are quite uh, um, part of a comedy. Uh, but Gaudenzio has uh, elements of comedy, of course, but also uh, some sort of uh, more elegant um, characteristics in terms of vocally and also as a, as a character, uh, which I find very interesting and challenging. Mm -hmm. Efeno, what's, what's Gaudenzio's last name? Gaudenzio. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very interesting name because uh, actually the first time that I read it, it's on the score and he presents himself at one point in, uh, in, in the opera uh, as uh, his name and last name is Gaudenzio Strappapuppole, which <laughs> cannot be more Italian than that. <laughs> like my, almost like my last name, De Peppo Strappapuppole. So it's, uh, there is something uh, similar. And Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're playing the title role. 
That's right, Signor Bruschino. But one of two, actually, Signor Bruschino's in these. Yes, <laughs> and one of a supposed three, but one of them is not really a Bruschino. So, <laughs> and we, you weren't familiar with this opera at all before? I was not, no. Yeah. I not, wasn't familiar with any of the farces. And is the, the role you're playing, a, it's a comic role or? It or? is, it's, it's kind of more of the role that Stefano was just talking about. That's a very buffo, very funny. Um, he's very grumpy. He has a lot to say about everything, even if it doesn't really need to be said. It's a lot of fun. I, I hope it'll be, be very funny, but uh, it's, as Stefano said, everyone in the cast gets a chance to show some acting chops and hopefully get a couple laughs. Um, <laughs> One of the, Richard, one of the things about chamber operas is you don't really see them in professional companies, but they are done a lot in schools. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is because they're smaller, the casts are smaller. Very often they are not as difficult to sing as an opera like Tosca, let's say. However, it's a little different with Rossini because not only are there amazing vocal challenges in this piece, but also the, it, the correct style of doing this is that you actually make the music harder than it is by adding, uh, adding notes where they're not written. So uh, this, there are a lot of moments of really wonderful bravura singing that certainly no college student could do or a, a small opera company. And correct me if I'm wrong, if it wasn't hard enough as it's written, you've added stuff. We've added stuff, yes. So, which was what, what happened in those days. If a singer had a talent for a certain note, you just held that note and you did something with it. Alex does a few of those, hold that note and do something with it. Um, so, yes, I've made it harder, of course. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so Stephanie, um, can you maybe, I hate to put you on the spot, but could you tell us a little bit about the story of the opera, what it's about? Yes, um, there's a young couple who want very much to be married. They're committed to one another. They're sure that they're gonna end up together. But the tutor of the girl uh, has a mortal enemy and it turns out that it's the father of the man that she's in love with. Thus ensues an opportunity for the young lover, the man to play as though he's, um, well, all right, and I have to, you're right, I have to back up a little bit. The, the, um, the tutor has chosen the son of Signor Bruschino as his, his ward's fiance, but she doesn't want to marry him. She wants to marry the man, this man that she's so in love with. So he's never met Signor Bruschino Jr. And so, the, the the young senior no <laughs> it's confusing as it it, it, yeah. we drew it florville who is the young lover pretends to be the young senior bruschino and tries to convince the tutor that that's who he is and they introduce him as as senior bruschino's son and senior bruschino of course says that's this isn't my son i don't know him and Gaudencio, the tutor, is very unhappy about that because he thinks that Signor Bruschino is rejecting his own son. So there's this mistaken identity, quote unquote, through the opera, trying to convince Signor Bruschino to accept this man as his son and therefore make the marriage happen. And at a certain point, there's a turning point in which Signor Bruschino is very happy to do that. And then it comes as a shock to Gaudencio to find out that the boy is his mortal enemy's son. So we have all sorts of jokes that happen throughout it. As this couple is determined to be married and the, and the older members of the, of the group of the cast are caught in this maelstrom of identity that isn't quite what it appears to be. And um, we have all sorts of opportunities to see them try to figure the whole mystery out. And it, it works itself out at the end and it's very amusing. It struck me when I was watching the run through uh, the other day, which by the way, for uh, I watched via Zoom because for our safety precautions, we have created a bubble of our artists and I'm not in the bubble. So, um, so I wasn't allowed in the room, but I watched it via Zoom, but it struck me how complex it was and how much 
was packed into this opera that's an hour and a half long. Is it about about an hour and a half? Right. Yeah. It seems like there's a lot of back and forth, and it's it's it must pose a challenge as a director to clarify all of these different threads threads in this story. Right, which I didn't do very successfully just now because there are so many different tangled <laughs> threads. But it's it's well explained in the opera. You just have to follow follow the surtitles, of course, and enjoy how the story unfolds. It's really splendid. And this young couple from the very beginning, they have a lovely love duet at the beginning, and you know that you want them to be together. And somehow it works out. Well, that's now. Stefano, you're you you do a lot of Rossini of this kind of kind of opera, correct? That's that's kind of your bread and butter. These kind of comic operas. Um, I would say so. Um, interesting um, for me because I started a uh, few years ago. I would say uh, even almost already uh, almost three decades ago. Um, I don't think that by nature I am a, a funny person or a, I've never been. Uh, you know the jolly fellow of the of the company. But uh, when I started my career about uh, thirty years ago, um, I was I was part of a uh, of an opera house in Mexico City, uh, and uh, they put me in. Uh, I, I had to fulfill my contract, so that I I had to be put in different operas, and they put me as one of the relatives in uh, Janis Kiki. Um, and uh, for some reason, I found myself um, to like this kind of, uh, of, of characters. And I remember that in, in a well, few people said, Stefano, you really have a very nice uh, comic uh, vein in, in yourself on stage, uh, not in, in, uh, in <laughs> normal life. No, not true. Um, so um, I started to be cast in uh, these kind of roles. And, and Rossini, of course, being uh, perhaps the master of, of the uh, comedic uh, operas of, of Italian repertoire, became a little bit my uh, mentor in terms of, uh, of, of my character. And I've sung a few of, uh, of the roles of the most uh, comic roles of uh, Rossini, together with some roles of Donizetti that came, of course, after Rossini, some roles uh, by Mozart before uh, Rossini. So that's my bread and butter, I would say. But Rossini uh, still uh, carries a, a quite a, an important part of my, um, of, of my person. And uh, this is my third Rossini role here in, uh, in uh, Sarasota. Uh, so it's, uh, it's great. It's great to be, to be once again uh, part of the Rossini family. Oh. <laughs> Uh, Alex, this is your second Rossini opera in a season, because you were in Lingano Felice too. Is now is this something different for you? Is this or is this? It's it's not entirely different, but it's not something I've done a lot of either. I was also in Italiana, Italian Girl at Sarasota. right, true. And then when I was in New York, I had done some some Figaro's and things like that. But I, I did a lot more Mozart, Mozart than Rossini. And it's very similar, but also very different as anyone. And do you does. think of yourself as a funny person? Is it? I, I like to, I like to, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> no, you don't think he's funny, Maestro? <laughs> um, I think but, Rossino is funny though. So I, I hope that'll be worthwhile. <laughs> I think it's interesting that that in in this season, we made we made a, a a bit about the fact that you and your wife were performing together, and of course you were in your own bubble, so you didn't have to social distance and all that. But of course, you know, in the in you don't ever play her love interest in this. <laughs> the flight of the baritone, yes, <laughs> it's just the way it works. But you did get to hide behind a tree in Lingano Favice. Yes, right? exactly. We've at least had some friendly relationships, which is still pretty unusual for a baritone soprano relationship this is true usually on stage they're not fans or the soprano is not usually the fan of the baritone i think i that that's true that happens a lot in opera so maestro one of the things i think people think about a lot with rossini is uh or his overtures and this opera has one in particular that's probably the best known piece in the opera 
it does. There's a, a question afoot about the uh, the instrumentation, which kind of refers to this, because as I said, the it's not a very big orchestra. There's a string section. It, the the woodwind section is uh, very often the woodwinds, which are flutes. They come what we say woodwinds in pairs: two flutes, two clarinets. Uh, two oboes and two bassoons, except Rossini wrote this for one bassoon and two horns, no two, as some people call French horns, two horns. Um, and this is, uh, and that's our orchestra, no percussion, uh, a string section, of course. Uh, but the interesting thing, there are two interesting things about this instrumentation. One is that there is a part for an English horn, which is a very beautiful instrument, not a standard part of an orchestra at this time. Uh, and it's uh, kind of like an oboe, but a deeper sound, a deeper sounding oboe. And uh, it was so much out of, out of the period that for many years, people thought he must not have meant this. He must, it must be written for a clarinet. And this beautiful solo, which introduces the soprano aria and pretty much makes her aria into duet is, is a very big part of the piece. So listen for the English horn solo uh, with the soprano's aria. But to return to your question, there is a moment in the in this, which is a, a, in the overture, which is quite uh, well known. And it's where the uh, violin, second violins are playing and they take their bow and they hit it against the music stand. They go, tack, 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 tack. And uh, that's one of our big moments in this opera. And there's something after, at the end of the autograph, Rossini wrote something like, may God assist us all or something to that effect. And in terms of why am I doing some crazy thing like this? But it did become a, a very much part of what Signor Bruschino, the overture is like. And it, it is, it's a beautiful overture. It's probably his first really famous of, of, his, of his overtures, which were, People were never not doing his operas for many years, but they were always doing his overtures, William Tell and Semiramide, Gazaladra, and this is the first of those overtures. So listen for our tapping of the music stands. Okay. And by the way, we, we were talking, I, I think maybe with Stefano talked about how this is an early piece. How early is it in Rossini's uh, over? Uh, he was three, maybe. But that's because he was born on February 29th. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> it, he was in his early 20s. He, he was 21. This is 1813, and he was born 1892. So it, it's quite a quite an early work for him, and he was quite a maybe not a prodigy, but he was certainly quite young when. when yeah, he, I think I think prodigy would do it. I mean, he wrote so fast and wrote such. The, the music is such fun. It's so. It just goes along and goes along and goes along. And it's kind of it's very typical of Rossini's later style as well, where the music just has this flowing sense about it. It mm -hmm. works beautifully. Now, Stephanie, when I think of the works that you direct here at Sarasota Opera, I tend to think of, you know, Tosca, Madame Butterfly, the big dramatic pieces. And um, you've done some comedies for us, but what's the difference between directing a comedy and a, and a, and a tearjerker? <laughs> well, I'm always very interested in what the singers bring to their roles. And I was particularly interested, I knew that this was a very talented cast and I was particularly interested to see what the singers would bring to their roles as comedians without making this slapstick or without trying to trying to make the audience laugh as opposed to having them be drawn into the to the situation and and bringing the humor out that way and the latter is definitely what's what's happening with this um exploring the comedy exploring the physical comedy um, finding out what, I mean, some of the singers have, have, I think they all have tried things on their own once we've staged, once I've staged it and, and shaped it. And a, a lot of it I've kept because their ideas are very good. And we get to see, again, individual personalities. And mm -hmm. it, it's not that that isn't true in a more dramatic piece like Tosca, but finding the humor has to come from the personalities and the timing that people can bring to this sort of thing. And I've really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's interesting that both of our singers here have said that they don't, they're not necessarily funny people in real life, but yet they're, they're doing it and bringing something there of their own to, to the comedy. No question. Yeah. Yes. I think I was, I think I was the one who said Alex is not really funny. Alex did. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Alex, that was a joke in case you didn't get it. <laughs> um, I think one of the, Maestro, I'm going to ask you this, and then I want to ask the two singers this. One of the characteristics of this kind of piece is that there is a lot of recitativo. Um, and if you could explain what recitativo is for, for everybody, and, and what are the challenges with recitativo? You'd like me to explain what is recitativo? Imagine we were having this conversation, but instead of speaking, we sang it. We didn't really sing melodies, but we sang something a little different than that. Okay, that's uh, what a recitativo is, mm. as opposed to largo, largo, which is not a recitativo. Um, there are many challenges for recitativi because they are completely uh, negotiated, completely interpreted by the singer. Uh, one of we we talked a lot about this in rehearsal, and there's a quote by. Uh, a, a great bass of the time whose name was La Blanche, and he said that the recitativo is the page of music that the, the singer autographs as being his own, that he wrote it. Mm -hmm. the, it, it. It is very difficult unless you're doing it in your native language. Uh, so we've worked a lot on how the language flows and uh, making the dramatic intention and and making the recitativo work. One of the things that I've been, what I wanna do is very often Americans and even Italians these days, because the audience doesn't really know what's going on, they kind of say, do the recitativo very fast and it doesn't, we try not to do that. We try to make a point with a recitativo. So if it's a line that would, uh, re would get a reaction, we assume that the audience is gonna to react to it. So we try to make it as natural and as much as much as it play as possible. So recitativo comes from the word recitare, and recitare is, is the word to, to perform a play in Italian. Mm -hmm. So first I want to ask Stephanie about staging recitativo. Is it much different than, you know, how does that differ from staging an aria? Right. I'm very grateful to Victor for having worked with the singers uh, in, in, great, in great detail with the recitativi so that we we had already arrived before I started staging at a, a concept of an approach, not a concept, but an approach to the, to the text that really, again, highlighted their characters and was true to the emotional situation of, of the, the conversations. That really helped my job a lot. Mm -hmm. And then as I staged it, we were able to develop that even further as, as people were figuring out, oh, I need to spend a little more time on this line here to make, to make it more dramatic, to make, to make the point, or this, this needs a big gesture, so we'll add that at that point. Um, so it, it all knitted together very well. I've, I've really enjoyed that aspect, and I confess I was a little concerned about it because I haven't done a lot of opera with Richie Tahibi, and I'm very glad to have worked with Victor on this specifically, on this piece for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the singers all have brought a tremendous amount of, of interest and focus and attention to making the recits, as we call them, uh, very clear and, and very expressive. So it's been a pleasure and it's much different than staging the, the arias and the duets and the, and the trios. It's a, it's a conversation like Victor just, just demonstrated. So I imagine Stefano, since you are a native Italian, it's fairly easy for you to do these, this kind of thing. Oh, uh, well, I definitely would say that it, it's easier uh, because I have the advantage of knowing by instinct, uh, it's part of my genes, uh, the uh, flow of the, of, of the phrase, of the sentence, um, but it, nevertheless, it's a challenge. It's a challenge because uh, not, be, not because one singer is Italian, it means that uh, he or she can do recitativi perfectly. So uh, it's definitely, it takes, uh, it takes some work. And the kind of work that we did here uh, with Maestro De Renzi, um, 
speaking the recitativi, uh, um, especially for non-native uh, singers, um, it was very, uh, very uh, helpful to really understand how the flow of the of the monologues, of the dialogues, the three people talking to each other, because this is what happens in recitativi. Basically, we are much more, uh, much freer uh, than uh, with the music because it's like a sort of a, of a play uh, with, uh, you know, uh, dialogues and but with notes, as Maestro said. Um, but of course, you have to really try to give as much as possible uh, a logic to the, uh, you know, the sentences and the um, dialogues so that it doesn't become really frustrating, uh, especially for the audience, because the recitativi can be something where the, the attention of an audience who doesn't know the language can be uh, definitely um, much less, because it, there is no the beautiful, be usually beautiful me melody underneath the aria, the duo, the duo, duet, the trio, etc. With the recitativi, we have only the piano or the forte piano, pianoforte or the harpsichord, depending here we have a piano, uh, you know, giving just some chords and then we um, uh, speak or better said we uh, sing recitativi uh, trying to give a sense. So it's definitely a challenge for, uh, for me too. And uh, I think that, um, you know, uh, watching my colleagues uh, that have to be to do an much bigger effort because you know Italian is definitely not part of their uh, system um, it has been really very uh, nice to see how they at the end they all sound as Italian as, as myself almost <laughs> <laughs> so Alex you know it's got to be your turn so as a non-native Italian speaker um, how was how much of a challenge and I, I would imagine learning it was a challenge it certainly bit. is, but it's one of my favorite parts because, as Maestro Dorenzi said, you do get a lot of freedom within it, but it's it's a freedom where you have to find the, there are more than one right choice, but you still have to find the right choice, and that's that's that instinct that Stefano says that he has that I don't have, mm -hmm. being a non-native speaker, and so we have to go a layer back, and you have to go just to the words without the music, and you have to work on it with someone who is a native speaker and get that that extra bit that they have that you just won't be able to produce on your own. You know, mm -hmm. you have to go to someone who can be scholarly about it and uh, not just scholarly, but naturally scholarly with it and get that extra dose of help before you can start at the level that Stefano is even talking about of doing that work of adding the music and your impetus and your acting beats to it. So it, it just, it does add an extra level of work. And you know, we study the languages and you try to become fluent, but it's it's just a lifelong pursuit. I think Did, also one of the issues, one of the issues that we have is that we, I don't know, I don't know if rigidity is the right word I'm gonna but use it, but we are, we are rewarded as musicians for being faithful to what is printed on the page. And in a recitativo, it's almost the opposite. You're rewarded for not being faithful to what's printed. Rossini didn't expect you to do what was printed on the page. He expected you to make it your own and use that as a guide. For the, an interesting thing about recitativi is in this opera and many Rossini operas, he didn't even write the recitativi. It was written by a theater, uh, a theater assistant who wrote them. So even Barbara Seville, which has some, I, the recitatives are wonderful, but Rossini had nothing to do with them. He wrote, he writes the musical parts, but not the recitativi. Oh, interesting. So, so that I, I didn't, we changed some words and we changed some notes and I have, you know, I didn't feel like, oh, I'm violating the great Rossini. I am violated, I violated someone whose name I don't even know. So we just did it. We, 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 we had a good time with it. I think I had a good time with it. So let me ask you a question now, and I'm sorry to harp on this particular element, but um, because uh, Victor and Stephanie, you play another role in this production, which is putting together the, the titles. Did Stephanie, I don't know if, who, which one of you did. How difficult is that? I noticed, for example, in, in some of the operas we did in February that there's some words that are left out. So how do you, you know, because it's, it goes by pretty quickly. So how do you address that when you're doing the, 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 sub, the surtitles? We have to do it, we, may I? Sure. We, we have to do it in such a way that the audience, we always want the audience to be able to read quickly and go back to the stage. 
And um, with recits, we just had to have to figure out what, what the most important element is in a conversation and present that and, and let it move along quickly without the titles going up so quickly that you can't follow the story. So it's a matter of timing and we'll know in at the piano dress and afterward, if the audience, we always have someone reading our titles for us um, mm -hmm. to see how, how it fits in the production. And we'll know if we need to eliminate some titles or stretch some titles. I mean, when we talked about the timing of the recits, it's extremely important to have the recits timed out properly in terms of the dramatic situation. And we have to do the same thing with the titles. And I imagine given that you have, you know, you did the titles before you went into rehearsal. You've, yes. you've, uh, you probably have to adjust them based on the performances where you may not have to do that in, in, uh, in Tosca because they sure. may speed it up or, or you know, do it maybe a way that you didn't hear in your head when you were first putting them together. Mm -hmm. no. Exactly. Okay. We'll see. We'll see. What adjustments have, what adjustments have to be made. Well, I always know it's a process when we go through the rehearsal process because I'm part of that, and I will be in the rehearsals uh, once we get on. You get on stage and and are doing the run throughs, so I can be in the actual audience and and far enough away from all you singer types that I don't uh, <laughs> don't break break the bubble. Um, so, Maestro, looking at this at this kind of work, you know, I probably didn't figure in our discussions about repertoire in the past, but is this something now you wouldn't mind doing in the future, these kinds of pieces? I, I think so, because I, I've come to the conclusion, as I said before, I've come to the conclusion that these, a lot of these works need to be done by professionals. Yeah. And yes, they certainly are in Europe, you know, the Pesado Festival, which does Rossini opera, you know, they're famous, that's what they do. They're, they do Rossini operas and they get the best Rossini singers in the world. And, but I think it'd be nice for our audience to hear more, more of this kind of repertoire. Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're very, and they also work very well in our theater. I don't know that a piece like Buschino would work in, you know, in Chicago or San Francisco or the Met where the theaters are big. You would lose, really lose most of the show. It'd be, you'd have to have television screens uh, like at a football game or something. Um, but here it works beautifully. I think you could see, you, you, you get to see people's acting, you get to do the, see the little gestures as well as the big ones. So uh, oh. I think we found some good works here. So I'm gonna change the conversation. I'd like to open it to everybody to talk about, I know we've talked about this in some of the previous ones, but how did trying to do this during COVID affect the process for you? And how did it make it more difficult or, or help, you know, is Stephanie with directing or singers interacting? How did this, you know, this whole bubble thing that we, we did to try to keep everybody safe, you know, how did that impact how you approached any of this? Did that change your, you know, or did you just do, was it just a normal process? And we just... I, I hate the uh, segments that we have to do because uh, we are not in a room longer than an hour and a half, and we have to air out the room. As you know, Richard, you're the uh, protocolist here, and uh, we're used to normally doing three-hour rehearsals. So uh, in a three-hour rehearsal, we can decide along the way when we're gonna break. You know, if we feel like we've done a lot, we need to break after 45 minutes, we do. If we wait for an hour and a half, we do. But in a situation uh, like this, we have we have that segment to fill, and we know if we don't use the time, we're not going to uh, we're not going to recoup it at any point. So for me, it's it's doing an hour and a half, then taking an hour break, then doing another hour, and it just breaks up my day in a way that is not pleasant. <laughs> that that to me, that's a, I didn't realize that would be such an issue, but it really is. Uh, as I look back on the rehearsal process. Well, and also having to wear masks. I mean, speaking to the cast through a mask was challenging to make sure that, that I was understood and was clear and they are doing the same thing. And then when we're rehearsing in the room, they have their masks on, very difficult. So, but everyone was patient and we somehow got it accomplished. And as singers, how did the, that process wearing the masks, how did that affect you? 
Well, um, I think that we all had to get used to masks for the past year and it has, has not been easy, of course, whenever we have been uh, to grocery stores or to places. I mean, I, I basically, the, that's the only uh, closed place where I've been apart from my home in the past. <laughs> um, but I had no idea how uh, it would be uh, feel uh, singing with masks because that's what we uh, had to, to do and I'm so grateful that all the things that you have um, organized arranged to protect this bubble really worked very very well and it was I think the only way um, to do what we were able to do and are able to do so uh, this is my second opera here I was here uh, in uh, January and February um, for La Serva Padrona and I have to say that it was a challenge to uh, sing with masks uh, during rehearsals uh, because, you know, even breathing um, regularly and, and talking, as Stephanie was saying, sometimes it's not easy. You have to uh, sometimes make an extra uh, breath and uh, speak a little bit louder. But singing with a mask, uh, it's definitely not the most pleasant uh, feeling. But uh, we, had to, we had to do it. So we had to learn how sometimes um, you know, we, uh, I cursed in Italian to myself, not to anybody, <laughs> because it's, it has been really, really challenging. But uh, once again, um, we are not doing that on, on, on stage, which, which is great. It's such, it was such a relief to start uh, the rehearsal process on stage. Uh, we are now in that um, segment and uh, being able to let go uh, without this uh, piece of fabric, which is uh, fantastic to to wear, uh, not so great to wear when you have to when you have to sing. So it's a challenge, definitely, but it's an absolutely um, unnecessary challenge. And Alex, do you feel similarly? Absolutely, yes. I mean, of course, we have to do it. And I'm so glad that we're in a scenario where we can have people in the room wearing masks and singing, even that. But it is incredibly challenging. And this role of Bruschino is, uh, I don't want to say it's a very physical role, but it's its not an unphysical role. And adding in that element of wearing a mask while you're doing things that feel like they shouldn't be as taxing as they are, and yet somehow they become more taxing than they, they should be. So it, it's definitely been very, very challenging. But of course, we, we will do everything that we have to, just as we always do, just as it's taxing to wear a a very heavy robe if you have to play a monk or whatever you know we all make the sacrifices that we have to make to do this so of course we'll we're happy to do it but being able to take it off and go back to performing on stage without it is a, a huge relief <laughs> <laughs> well i'm going to open up to some of the questions that are in the q a um uh, herbert fox writes do, do once you decide on one of these lesser known operas where do you find the score and stage directions and such Oi. That's a that's a, a very a interesting question, um, and to to kind of understand it, I, I I'll not make this too long. But when Rossini and Donizetti and people like that wrote an opera, when you think of the opera Tosca, Tosca exists. It is Tosca. Puccini wrote it, and you did a, you did his version of Tosca. But when 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 uh, Rossini or Donizetti wrote an opera they went to a different theater and changed that opera. So very often there are three or four different versions of, the, of those operas. And you find out that in one theater, they didn't do a certain aria, they replaced it with another aria. Um, so it, it is a, it's hard to find material for, for many of these operas. Unfortunately for us, there is a Rossini, what is called the critical edition, which it, which means that scholars who really know this music and understand Rossini's handwriting and have gone to theaters all over all over the world and found manuscripts have put together a, a performing edition of this and that's what that's where we get the material for an opera like Signor Bruschino. Okay. It was a little harder with Inganno Felice because there was not a critical edition because there was not Rossini's autograph the score that Rossini actually wrote by hand uh, did not exist, does not exist, or at least is not known to exist. 
So with this, it was it was an easier job. And stage directions are in the libretto. They are written there. Uh, not that everybody does all of them all of the time. And not that you only do those, because it would be pretty stagnant opera if you only did the stage directions in the score. But uh, we, we do those. Stephanie, you want to? No, I think you've explained it very well. Thank you. <laughs> Another question we have from Wally Kramer, who, speaking of Lingano Felice, has listened to both Lingano Felice and Signor Buschino. He he likes both operas, but he found Lingano um, a little bit more musically interesting. How do you? What do you think? And I think uh, Alex, you might have something to say because you were in. You've been in both, so I don't know. Do you? Do you have an opinion about about? I, I personally, I find Buschino to be a little more musically interesting, but I'm glad to hear someone with a different opinion because. I'm glad people enjoyed Ngannou, you know? <laughs> and I think to a certain extent, you have to love whatever you're doing. So it's hard for me to say, it's hard for me to say anything bad about either one because we're fresh off of one and in the middle of another one. <laughs> I would say my favorite is Signor Bruschino because we have to sell tickets to that. <laughs> the tickets are already gone for Ngannou Felicia. However, I would say to Wally, I'd, I'd be interested in knowing how he feels when he sees them both on the stage because I think that's really what opera is about, is about seeing it on the stage. And I know, uh, Wally, I know you came to the, the first performances and it'll be, I, yeah, I would like to know when you see them both, how, how you feel with suddenly in a theater with, a, with the sets and costumes. And it's a beautiful set, by the way. We, I, I think uh, people have been surprised coming to, to the first two operas that they actually look like uh, opera productions. We don't, we don't do them, uh, we do what, what they need. And the set for Signor Buschino is beautiful as are the costumes from our costumes uh, that we, that Sarasota Opera owns. And uh, yeah, I think that's one of, the, one of the, the comments I got because not being in the bubble, I'm in the audience. And I typically stand outside after every performance. And after the two operas we did in February, people were, I don't want to say pleasantly surprised, but they came out saying, oh, these were Sarasota opera productions, even if they're smaller operas and, and you know, shorter, um, that they were, you know, productions like we do. So it was not, um, I'm glad people, I guess I'm not glad that people were pleasantly, uh, were surprised because, you know, hopefully they expect a certain quality from us and, and we did it. So um, now the operas we're doing this season in order to be able to gain as wide an audience as, as we can, because some people are not yet comfortable coming to a theater and totally understand that. Um, happily for these performances, the April performance, many more people are vaccinated. So uh, our ticket sales are higher for these performances than they were for the February ones. But um, we are going recording them on video and making them available for streaming. So. Um, Lindsay Nickel de la O says, how do we, uh, how does working with a digital virtual pr platform for these performances impact elements like titles? Um, the, the, I guess the strongest impact is it, we, we don't, one of the things we've all been trying to do is seeing that the streaming that we do is what we do as an opera company. So we try not to do something very different. We don't do, uh, you know, we suddenly don't do a ballet during the overture. And so we try to keep it as close to our, close to our production as possible. And I think, I don't think we made changes for, uh, Richard, you deal, dealt with the streaming more than I did. We didn't make changes to the titles for the first two. I think we just did them, right? No, I, we didn't. Um, I think we just did them as we were doing them on the, um, on the, the, you know, in the performances. We just, you know, we did them live as we were recording the video. So we didn't add them afterwards. So we did them, somebody sitting there with a score, just doing them as if they were doing them in the theater. So the challenge is a little bit finding the place on the screen where they can go so that people can read them. We had a little bit of an issue with Lingano Felice and we, we know what, what to, uh, to do going forward on that. So, so good. Um, in our Q&A box, by the way, earlier on, Catherine Noble wished uh, Stephanie a happy birthday. So I just thought I'd share that. Um, and I see we have an attendee with their hand up. So I'm going to try to um, 
allow him to talk and see if he can. Uh, it's Tom Driscoll, Driscoll. And okay, you can speak. I think you're muted, but if you'd like to speak. Can I unmute? Let's see. Unmute. Victor. Tom, how are you? I haven't seen you in many years. It's been tons of years. I've missed you guys down there, and you are so surprising and wonderful to keep going down there. The news here, Karen has fled Manhattan for Montclair, New Jersey, all right? So that's probably not the only person in the world that's done that. But anyway, you do great work. I miss, I'm, I'm going to come down, okay? I'll do it. Tom, uh, Tom's Tom's daughter sang with us many years ago. His name is Karen. Mm -hmm. Karen Driscoll mm -hmm. comes down from New has been coming down from New England for many years. So, yep. look forward to seeing you again. All right, you guys look great. Okay. Well, thank you, thank you, Tom. Well, it's been um, a nice hour of conversation, and I hope uh, people enjoyed our uh, our talk today. And uh, I hope you'll join us again. We will be doing our last Meet the Artist for our production of Dido and Aeneas. And atypically for us, this, I think this may be the first time we're actually doing it after the show opens, uh, on the 14th of April, we will be doing the uh, Meet the Artist for Dido and Aeneas. And Maestro, you will be the host for that one. So uh, you will be able to talk, although I'll, I'll be online to make sure that everything goes okay. And uh, we're glad everybody joined us and we hope to see everybody at the productions or watching it on video. And we hope that by this time next year, we'll be back to normal and having uh, everybody in the theater and enjoying live opera again. So thank you, Stefano De Peppo, Stephanie Sundin, Alex Boyd, and Maestro Dorenzi for taking the time to talk to us today. And we'll look forward to seeing Il Signor Bruschino, which opens on April the 9th. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.